Hello, and welcome to this E3 Solutions presentation on how to calculate greenhouse gas emissions. In today's presentation, we will examine what information on sources and activity data you need to collect, the purpose and function of emission factors, how to apply global warming potentials, and how to total your emissions. A source in this context is an activity that impacts the organization's operations and results in the emission of greenhouse gases. Some examples are listed here. The six categories of greenhouse gases identified under the Kyoto Protocol are carbon dioxide, CO2, methane, CH4, nitrous oxide, N2O, sulfur hexafluoride, SF6, hydrofluorocarbons, HFCs, and perfluorocarbons, PFCs. Note that HFCs and PFCs are not single gases, but rather groups of multiple greenhouse gases, each with varying effects on climate change. In order to determine which greenhouse gases your organization will be responsible for reporting, you'll first need to gather activity data on your organization. For each activity, you'll need to determine what the source of the data will be. For instance, will the data come from a bill from the provider, or will it come from a meter on site? Furthermore, you'll also need to determine in what units of measure the data will be provided. Sometimes there may be multiple units of measure for a single source. Once the organization's activity data has been gathered, the next task will be to translate this into one or more quantities of greenhouse gas. Note that oftentimes a single activity type can produce more than one type of greenhouse gas. For instance, the burning of natural gas typically produces CO2, CH4, and N2O. In order to perform this conversion, we typically use one or more emission factors. An emission factor is a ratio corresponding to the amount of a greenhouse gas emitted as a result of a given unit of activity. Typically, when an emission factor is listed, it will be listed with a unit of quantity of greenhouse gas over a functional unit of activity. Some examples are listed below. Emission factors are often provided by government institutions, such as the US EPA or Environment Canada. Emission factors may also be obtained from utility and service providers and from academic and scientific research papers. Now let's look at a practical example. Suppose that a natural gas bill has a value of 14,356 meters cubed of natural gas. The burning of natural gas emits CO2, CH4, and N2O. For this example, three emission factors have been provided. To obtain the GHG emissions resulting from this activity, the amount of natural gas must be multiplied by each emission factor, as shown here. Note that in each case, the meters cubed unit is cancelled out, leaving only the unit of GHG. A final note regarding GHG calculations and emission factors. There are certain cases where the activity is itself an emission of greenhouse gases. This is most commonly the case with fugitive refrigerant emissions or refrigerant leaks. Some examples are listed here. HFCs are a common refrigerant. When these are leaked to the atmosphere, they represent an emission of greenhouse gases. However, since the activity data is already in a unit of greenhouse gas, a multiplication by an emission factor is not required. We now have 
accurate quantities of each greenhouse gas emitted due to the activity. Unfortunately, we can't simply add the three numbers together to come up with a total. You see, each of these greenhouse gases is not equal in terms of its effect on global warming. In order to correctly add up these three emission quantities, they must first be converted into a common unit. This is accomplished by applying global warming potentials. A global warming potential is a ratio denoting the effect of a quantity of a greenhouse gas on climate change compared with an equal quantity of carbon dioxide. This value is usually calculated over a 100 year period. Because global warming potentials are based on carbon dioxide, the GWP value of carbon dioxide is always 1. The results of applying a GWP are expressed in carbon dioxide equivalent, or CO2e. GWP values are periodically refined as newer science becomes available. Now let's return to the previous example and apply global warming potentials to the results of each calculation. Since the GWP of carbon dioxide is 1, the amount, when converted to CO2e, remains the same. The GWP value for methane is 25. This means that emissions of 1 ton of methane have the same effect on climate change over a 100 year period as the emission of 25 tons of carbon dioxide. When the amount of methane, approximately 0.0005 tons, is multiplied by 25, the result is 0.0125 tons of CO2e. Similarly, multiplying the amount of N2O produced by a GWP of 298 produces a value of 0.149 tons of CO2e. This serves to demonstrate how quantities of gases such as methane and nitrous oxide, which at first glance appear insignificant, in fact contribute sizably to climate change. Now that each of the emissions is in a common unit, they can be summed up to provide a single value representing the greenhouse gas emissions resulting from that activity as shown here. To calculate a complete organizational carbon footprint, it will be necessary to perform calculations similar to the ones we've just completed for each activity data point collected within a reporting period. For instance, it will probably be necessary to perform a calculation for each natural gas bill and each electricity bill. It may also be necessary to perform such calculations for each gas receipt submitted for vehicles in your company's fleet or for business travel by your employees. Once you have calculated emissions resulting from each piece of activity data as a quantity of carbon dioxide equivalent, you can sum these values up to determine how much GHG has resulted from each activity over a reporting period often one year. Shown on this table is an example of a fictitious organization's greenhouse gas emissions expressed in tons of carbon dioxide equivalent over a one year period. Note that in this table, emissions are grouped according to scope. The scope is the level of control that the company can exercise over the activities which generate the emissions. Scope 1 emissions are energy emissions which occur on site or using company owned and operated assets. Scope 2 emissions are emissions which occur as a result of producing energy which is used by the organization. Scope 3 emissions are emissions that result from activities that impact the organization in some way but are emitted by assets not owned and operated by the organization. For more information on scopes, please see the presentation 
Introduction to Carbon Footprinting by E3 Solutions. For more information on this and other presentations by E3 Solutions, you may contact us using the information provided here. Please also visit us on our website at www.e3solutionsinc.com. You can also follow us on Twitter and join our LinkedIn discussion group. Thank you, and have a great day.